Hi, I'm Dawn Vogel. I'm the author of the new steampunk novel, Brass and Glass, The Cask of Crang Limmering, which comes out on April 1st. And today I'm going to read a little preview of it. This is from the first chapter, so you're going to get to meet all the characters um, from the crew of the Silent Monsoon, which is an airship. Um, this book's all about airship pirates, which is something that I really love, so I hope you enjoy it. The deck of the Silent Monsoon pitched, and Svetlana clung to the polished brass wheel of the airship. She turned to look at the pilot with her good eye, not daring to release the wheel long enough to adjust her monocular. Damn it, Joe, will you please keep this boat level? Try and, Captain. Talk to your mechanic about the stabilizers. Joe's speech came out in bursts, punctuated with grunts. She struggled to maintain the position of the altitude controls, her muscles taut and knuckles showing bone white through her tan skin. Captain, we're near enough to run out the ship to ship, or I think. The ship's doctor, Annette, stood near the speaking tube, the length of hollow brass that allowed conversation between two airships. Air rushed through the telescoped metal tube, creating a high-pitched whistling that grated on Svetlana's nerves. Outside of the windscreen, the bulk of a second airship hovered perilously close. Chrome detailing gleamed across its dark teak hull. The bright blue and white flags marked it as one of Heliopolis's Port Authority vessels. You think? Joe asked. Yes, I think, Annette spat, spat back, her dark brown eyes flashing. I can't be certain, seeing as this isn't exactly part of my job. Perhaps if our communications officer hadn't gone and gotten himself arrested, and if you hadn't abandoned him to that fate, he could be more certain if we were near enough. Svetlana shook her head. Holler at them if you want, but I don't think they're too interested in talking. And I just want to get Athos back. Are we close enough to net him? Joe looked out the windscreen. I'm not sure we can get that close without ramming them. Well, that is an option. The windscreen fogged as the airship passed through a cloud bank. From somewhere in the distance came a familiar war cry, followed by a muffled thump outside of the bridge. Or perhaps he'll just find his way over here on his own. Svetlana spun the directional wheel to swing the silent monsoon away from the Port Authority airship. Three additional thumps followed in rapid succession before Svetlana's ship maneuvered away. Boarded? Annette asked. She looked toward the altitude controls. Svetlana turned to follow her gaze. Joe had vanished from the bridge, the controls she had been manning locked into position. Apparently, Svetlana said, beckoning Annette to the directional wheel. Hold this course unless... A pained wail interrupted the rest of her orders. Svetlana cursed under her breath and broke into a run toward the aft deck. Sounds of pummeling and Athos's sharp intakes of breath kept Svetlana's pace quick. As soon as she rounded the corner to where the fight was taking place, a loud voice boomed. That's enough, Henry. Captain Tereshenko, we're just here for a social visit. Svetlana surveyed the scene. Three uniformed men, wearing the insignia of the Heliolo Heliopolis Port Authority, surrounded Athos. Athos's head hung forward, spilling a mass of blonde and brown curls across his face. His white shirt was torn and caked with dirt. Even if Athos had not been possessed of a charming personality, his physical appearance would still have earned him hordes of admirers. His skin was the fine, pale copper of a new small coin, and his hair was in tight curls worn past his shoulders. He was tall without being imposing and muscular without being bulky. Svetlana, on the other hand, knew him too well to be swayed by his good looks. After she'd inadvertently rescued him from a bar fight when they were in the Air Fleet Academy together, the two had become fast friends. Even years later, he was still getting into trouble, and she was still bailing him out. One bravo held Athos's thick arms behind his back, while a second bravo stood in front of him, fist at the ready. A third man, tan with hair the color of old straw, and with his corporal's bars decorating his uniform, leaned against the railing of, his, of the deck, examining his fingernails. I didn't know social visits usually came with beatings, Corporal Richards. Svetlana slowed her pace and approached with a slight swagger in her step, stopping nearer to him than social niceties dictated, and crossing one arm over her chest while she adjusted her monocular with the other. <clears throat> Richards changed from being a shapeless blur to a human-shaped blur. She shifted her head to peer at him with her left eye. Richards towered over Svetlana, but she glared up at him all the same. What's the occasion? Richards took a half step back and gestured to Athos with a smirk. Tucker here. I'm sorry, Tucker. I don't know your rank around here. What is it? Drunkard, Tucker? Athos looked up from under his curls and glared at Richards. 
His eyes were crystal and blue with a glassy sheen that wasn't normally there. A shiner had begun to blossom around his right eye, and dried blood left dark trails through his mustache and goatee. Sawed off, he slurred. Commander Tucker, Svetlana said from between clenched teeth. Oh, so you're keep, still keeping to the air fleet command structure. How cute, Richard smirked. His breath hung foul between them, bitterly scented by some pungent tea. The air fleet took their command structure from the sailing ships of the old days. Why wouldn't we use it? Not here to bicker. As I said, just a social call. I'd like to talk about an exchange. My men found Tucker in the city center. What were the charges, Henry? Henry, the bravo in front of Athos, bald with skin the color of a fish's belly, answered. Drunken disorderly, consorting with known prostitutes. Oh, and assaulting an officer of the law. Svetlana smirked. Yes, that sounds just like Athos. And what exactly do you propose to exchange him for? Well, it's said that you're harboring a known what wanted fugitive, one Josephine Dean. Joe Dean, the infamous pirate, Svetlana gasped, feigning an upper-class accent. Oh my, I can't possibly imagine that horrible woman being here. Why, I'd just need a big, strong corporal like you to protect me from her. Then perhaps we'll have a look around for her. Suit yourself, but I don't think you'll find her. Of course not. Somehow she always seems to bugger off when the law's at hand. So I suppose we'll just have to see what else you might have in your hold. He started to turn away toward her blind side, and Svetlana shifted to keep him in her sights. Say, you didn't happen to take on liquor as part of your cargo today, did you? What ship doesn't take on liquor at every port, she asked with a laugh, gesturing at Athos. Guess he was just holding his share in his gut, huh? Oh no, I doubt it. We're looking for a very specific cask, one for rarefied tastes, the sort of thing you don't just pick up at the usual suppliers. Afraid not, Corporal Richards. We're all square. You can review our car cargo manifest at the Port Authority. Shame. If you had that cask, we'd clear out of here and have the charges against Tucker dropped. No questions asked. Richard's eyelid trembled when he spoke. The bravo holding Athos licked his lips. The bald one, Henry, stared straight ahead, but a bead of sweat slid down his nose despite the crisp winter air. I'm thinking it's worth a bit more than that to you. Do I sense someone offering a reward for this liquor? Richard's face slid into a sly smile. I've heard that there might be. Athos caught Svetlana's good eye and mouthed a single word, mill. Ten percent, Svetlana said. Richards blinked and turned back to her. And Athos, of course. All right, fair enough. Ten percent, and we release Tucker. No charges. Svetlana looked over Richards with her good eye. His hands shook, though he kept them clenched at his sides to try to hide it. What's in the cask? she asked. In a whisper, with the reverence used when speaking of the Sky Father, he said, Kringlimmering. Svetlana's hand flew up and covered her mouth in an ineffectual attempt to hide her shock. She chewed at her finger for half a second before she responded. How long does the offer stand? Bring it back before it's uncorked, and we'll call it good. Ten percent of the reward. After it's uncorked? He shrugged. Well, it's not worth squat to us then. Svetlana nodded, and Richards responded in kind. As soon as Richards turned around, his man released his grip on Athos's arms. Athos crumpled to the deck in a tangle of limbs. Henry blew on a small chrome whistle, and the Port Authority ship, which had continued to keep pace with the silent monsoon, maneuvered alongside for the officers to board. Only after Richards had left the ship did Athos prop himself up, his arms shaking. Annette rushed to his side, her long legs folding beneath her as she crouched. Dark hair pulled back into a messy bun and sleeves rolled up to her elbows. She pulled up Athos's chin. Drugged, she asked. Yeah, I was drinking tea at Abalone's. Vision got all fuzzy, and then I started getting punched. Annette looked back at Svetlana. For a moment, Annette's true age showed in her eyes. They were so dark brown that they looked black, the same color as her hair. Her deep, coppery-brown skin made them look even darker. The skin around her eyes creased with worry. And they say there's no honor among thieves. I think the blame is misplaced. No, no honor here either. But now we've got something to look for. Where's Indy? Before she turned around, Indigo, the ship's mechanic, was at her right elbow. He was a growing teenage boy, all flailing long limbs and bones nearly jutting through his pale, freckled skin. His bones had been that close to the surface a year previous, when Svetlana and her crew found him, but in that year she swore that all of his limbs had doubled in length, shooting him up to her own height, with imminent threats of surpassing her any day now. His hair, the source of his nickname, made him easy to spot, 
The unusual color was common among the people of his homeland in differing shades normally reserved for flowers and birds in warm climates. The few who left that tropical place often went by the color of their hair as a nickname. Svetlana had heard his real name uttered once, a multisyllabic thing that was far too long for everyday use. Damn it, boy, how do you do that? Indigo shrugged, a small smile on his lips. Magic, I guess. His eyes, almost the same shade as his hair, twinkled as his gaze played across Svetlana's monocular. He always approached Svetlana on her blind side. Svetlana sighed. Did we sustain any damages you can't fix in flight? The boy shook his head, his wavy hair flopping in every direction. Not even a scratch. Nice flying all. Annette, take Athos below. I'll join you when I'm sure that our visitors are on their way. If you're interested in reading more of Brass and Glass, The Cask of Krang Limmering, you can find it at the Razor Girl Press website, which is razorgirlpress.com, or on Amazon.